self-sufficiency or sustainable energy. Energy sovereignty goes to the idea that the individual has the final right to decide how much energy they will create, how much energy they will store. Currently we have a little issue in some of the states that offer what's called net metering. Now, net metering is where the utility company stores power for you, basically. You create it using solar panels on, on the roof of your home. Those then send power to the grid during the day that is in excess of the power that you're using. This really helps take the strain off of the grid in certain areas, especially because solar operates in peak times traditionally for uh, utility production in the midsummer in the middle of the day. That's when you have most of the power produced by the solar panels and that's also when everybody seems to have their air conditioning on and that kind of thing. So the problem that they're having is when people produce way more than what they can use. So the utility companies lately have taken to thinking that they can tell you how much solar you can have on your roof. Now they don't actually want you to produce more power than you use. They want you to continue to purchase power. So their argument on some faces of it has merit. They don't want you to just create a um, tax subsidized power company for yourself. I think part of that is, you know, part of that is fair. But it's dangerous in that it makes them feel that they have the ability to tell you how much energy you have on your roof. The concept of energy sovereignty does away with that. Um, and the way it does away with it is by not having the individual really have that much to do with the utility company. Once you have energy storage at your home in the form of batteries, that allows you to sever yourself to a greater degree from the grid power. Now, will you go 100% off grid? No, likely not, and you probably wouldn't want to because the 
having the ability to be tied into the grid to use that as a fail-safe, I think that's appropriate. And I also think that it's also appropriate that we budget for the maintenance of the grid. I think that the grid is important for many other things as well. We can maybe get into that at length in, a, in, a, in some of the other videos as to why being tied to a grid is a good idea. But what's not a good idea is to have these massive, massive systems to distribute power from one region to another. The losses are incredible for one thing. And so there just isn't a need, I don't think, to transmit um, such massive amounts of energy into areas that could be mostly self-sustaining. We've done some calculations as far as how much battery storage someone needs at their home. We're in the process of putting together a proof of concept. Some of these numbers are a little difficult to get your head around and it's difficult to actually tease out what the real world meaning is to you as a consumer. And those are what we're, those aspects of, of this is what we're trying to address with the Energy Sovereignty Project. We need your help to do this. The, uh, it, it takes money to produce these videos and it takes money to put the equipment together. So please, if you could, visit our Patreon page. Laid out a little more completely what our goals are for the project. But to put it simply in, in, in terms of this video, we're trying to put together proof of concept showing the types of solar panels that one could reasonably purchase how much those cost now, which is less important than uh, how much energy the solar panels produce, and how much storage you need in a home. It's more than what they're telling you. How much that storage costs now, but again, not the focus on the cost now because today is not tomorrow cost of the energy storage is coming down, we're simply putting this proof of concept together to identify how much storage you need. And then the most important piece of the pie is how you, as a consumer, will hook this up to your home. So we're working with our partners at Highline Controls in Livermore, California, and we're going to lay out the equipment and the programs that you'll use to interface with the equipment, being able to monitor it from your home, being able to monitor it remotely from the web. And we will make available all of those, uh, uh, all of those programs for free. So provided you use the same components that we identify to set up your home system. Uh, you'll be able to download the control programs and use it right away. It should be mostly uh, plug and play. And as you'll see in the proof of concept that we're putting together, this will allow you to see directly what will happen when you hook up, say, the Powerwall 2 what will happen when you hook up two of the Powerwall 2s, what will happen when you hook up four of the Powerwall 2s, and then finally, what will happen when you hook up six? What would that look like? What would it look like to have 90 kilowatts of storage at your home while you're using an electric vehicle? Now, it's important not to focus too much on the cost of this right now. The viable electric vehicles, those with over 200 miles on them, approaching 300 miles, they're a little expensive.
But what we're doing with this proof of concept is we're telling the manufacturers, this is how much power you need to make the vehicle viable. Then it becomes incumbent on them to make that amount of energy affordable. Maybe it won't be 90, maybe it'll be 60, maybe it'll be 30. But with the addition of a, an electric vehicle, by our calculations, what we've reasoned is that at this latitude and this elevation, where we don't have snow, with a 60 kilowatt storage system, you will not use any energy nine months out of the year. With 90 kilowatts of storage for that same nine months out of the year, you will not only use no energy for your home, an average home using about 30 kilowatt hours of uh, use a day. Not only will you not use any energy, but you will have 100 miles of free driving. And again, this addresses that Ooh. argument of, oh, if everybody went to uh, uh, electric vehicles tomorrow, it would crash the grid. Mm. No, it won't actually. Not by what we're not by what we're calculating. Uh, it does shift what become peak times. It shifts what become peak time of the year. But we'd like to do this proof of concept study to get some real numbers, some solid numbers that we can then give to you, so that you'll have the ammunition needed to then take to these manufacturers and say, look, this is how much I need, this is how much production I need, this is how much storage I need, this is how much storage I need in a car. So I hope you found this interesting and uh, uh, again this is just a short video as we're trying to put together our camera equipment and trying to uh, finalize our uh, editing structure so that we can get these videos to you. Uh, in a timely manner and uh, again I, uh, I hope this is a topic that's of interest to you and I'm hoping that you will be able to help us out with this so for the process my name is Patrick Dolby we'll sign off for now and thank you for watching please remember to like and subscribe and we'll keep these videos coming